Now, another unique thing about sharing is what you pour out creates capacity for more. You must be willing to do the things today others won't do. In order to have the things tomorrow others won't have. Because it's those moments of feeling discouraged or feeling like you're not good enough that makes you feel like settling is your only option. Most people don't reach their dream mount because of failure. Most people don't live their dream because they give up. You see, it's not the failure that stops us, but that most stop at their first failure. Those who succeed don't stop at one failure. They don't stop at ten failures. They don't stop at a hundred or a thousand or a million. They say, "This is my goal, and I will do whatever it takes to achieve it." I will learn the lessons from any failures. I will learn faster. I will work harder. I will work smarter, and I will not quit until my dream is a reality. That's the difference between success and failure. Failure is a massive part of being able to be successful. You have to get comfortable with failure. You have to actually seek failure. Failure is where all of the lessons are. You know, when you go to the gym, you work out. You're actually seeking failure. So if you pour out what you know, if you pour out what you feel, if you let go in a sharing way, the good things that have come your way—it's part of the skill in the marketplace of developing success, wealth, and value. And I would wish that for you. In fact, all of the things we've talked about today. I would wish for you the benefit that comes from it all, but I know that it takes the discipline first. One last phrase: promise is on the other side of price. For the promise, you must always pay the price. I'm sure we've all watched the television show Fame. That's why the Book of Life said, "The road to life is straight and narrow, and few there be that find it, because few there be that are willing to do the things today." Others won't do. In order to have the things tomorrow, others won't have. What are the things that others won't do? Number one, make discipline a major force in your life. How many of you know if you'd have been more disciplined, you'd be further along to reach your goals right now? Socrates said, "The undisciplined life is an insane life. The road to life is straight and narrow because few there be that are willing to discipline themselves." Here's something else that most people won't do: make it okay to fail. A lot of people, 85% of people, allow their fear of failure to outweigh their desire to succeed. Or the teacher says, "Here's where you start to pay. If you want the glory of the stage, and not just the glory of the stage, but the glory of a unique family. If you want the glory and the recognition of a unique enterprise." If you want the glory of a job well done, you got to pay up front, and this is part of the pay. But once you get a taste of value, you don't mind paying the discipline. So I want to thank you today for letting me come by and have a chance to visit with you, and I wish for you all these good things that come from paying the price. The next time we get together, I'm sure we'll be able to trade some stories about the value we've gotten from sharing with each other today. Thank you for inviting me. See you next time. Develop the ability to share. Pass along to someone else. If you picked up a good idea today, pass it along. Don't let it stay. Pass it along. Repeat after me, please. Anything that's worth doing is worth doing badly. Yeah. See, anything is worth doing is worth doing right, as we have been taught. If you know how to do it. But if you don't know how to do it, it's worth doing badly until you get it right. I bet you, and I wasn't there. I bet you that when Bishop T. D. Jakes first stood up to preach, when he gave his trial sermon, he did not have the command, he did not have the mastery, he did not have the confidence, he did not have the depth, he did not have the capacity to translate and milk scripture like he did last night when he first started out. Now write this down: You don't have to be great to get started, but you have to get started to be great. You want to take your muscles to the point where you get to failure because that's where the adaptation is. That's where growth is. Successful people fail a lot. They fail a whole lot more than they succeed. They extract the lessons from the failure and they use that the energy and they use the wisdom to come around to the next phase of success. Got to take a shot. You have to live at the edge of your capabilities. You've got to live where you're almost certain you're going to fail. The reason for practice. Practice is controlled. Failure. You're getting to your limit. Getting to your limit. Getting to your limit. You can't lift that. You can't do that until you get to the point that all of a sudden your body makes the adjustment, and then you can do it.
Failure actually helps you to recognize the areas where you need to evolve. So fail early, fail often, fail forward. Failure makes winners stronger, failure makes winners hungrier. But it makes most give up, it makes most feel worthless. Talk to your grandfather, grab an older person, just hear them talk, and the only thing that pains them is not failure, it's not disappointment, it's regret. And we're not talking about never settling, I'm not talking about your food, I'm not talking about your hotel, I'm not talking about anything tangible. I'm talking about your life, I'm talking about your dreams. Don't give up, man. How would you commit it to the goal? Because sometimes the strategy didn't work. That doesn't mean the goal is not attainable. Don't ever fear starting over. You need to change the strategy, not give up on the goal. The goal is still the goal. Let's redirect, let's refocus, let's regroup, let's retool. Let's try another way, but don't give up on your goal. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? I didn't wait for the world to say I was one. I told myself I was one. And once I told myself I was one, everything around me, everything around me started to support what I was saying. So victory, all right? Hope, hope. You have to believe it when you cannot see it. You have to speak it when it's not serious. You have to speak it and say it's so, so that it can become a reality. What's it worth to you? Because if you can speak it, if you can say it, you're going to eventually get to it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you can speak it, if you can say it, you're going to eventually get to it. All right, listen to me very closely. My last one. You got to get this one in your spirit. You have to take residence with it. All right, you got to take residence. You can't be playing with it. You can't, you, you can't, you know, one minute you're doing it, the next minute you're not. One month you're doing it, the next minute you're not. We're not talking about consistency right now. We talked about consistency before. We're not talking about consistency right now. I'm talking about residence. You got to surrender to that thing. Winners don't enjoy failure, but they would never let failure stop them. Next time you encounter failure, you've got to remember every great thing on this planet is here because the creator learned what did work, but learned more from what did not work. When we are kids, we don't stop at failure. When we first learn to ride a bike, it's failure after failure. We get knocked down time after time, but we get up and push forward. And so we'll achieve our goal of riding the bike. But then we get old and most of us get weak. We are too soft to get back on the bike. We come up with excuses. It must not be for me. No, you just soft. No, you just lazy. Tell yourself the truth, get back on the bike, learn why you failed, and make sure you don't fall again, make sure you are stronger for having the lesson. You know, it's always a little bit frustrating to me when people have a negative relationship with failure. Fail early, fail often, fail forward. Don't ever commit to the strategy more than the result. When you settle, you ruin the movie. Yeah, you heard me. Your life is a movie and you are the author. Your life is a movie and you are the director. Life is a movie. And you need to edit some scenes out. The pen is in your hand, my friend, and you're writing your very own personal movie. And I believe the good guy wins in the end. I believe the good woman wins in the end. I believe that you will win in the end as long as you don't settle. When you settle, you ruin the finale. When you settle, you ruin the final scene. We are all tuned into your movie. So I'm gonna give you an example, right? I'm in stats class and I'm trying to become a statistician. I'm trying to take my game to a whole other level, right? So I'm in stats class the other day. This is my final class and my man is talking. I'm trying to work the problem out, right? And, and I'm trying to, we talking about the mean, right? The standard deviation, right? He's giving us the formula. You, 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 you add this to this, you know, once you add this to this, you divide this by two. He's breaking the whole thing down and then he does it in the adverse and I'm lost. Right. But then he finally breaks it down so I can understand. And I go after class saying, look, I, uh, 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 you got to take me. You got to start all over again. You got to hear what I'm saying. I want to be possessed by it. I wanted to take residence. I got to surrender to it. I got to put my whole stuff in. I don't just want the answers because if I just get the answers, I got to keep coming to you to get the answers. I want to see the big picture. I want to understand it. I want stats to come out of my mouth. I want to possess it. I want stats to be who I am. I want to be in the next two or three years of statistician. You're here right now at this moment because tomorrow you want to be somebody greater than the person you are today. You see yourself succeeding, you have a vision, you have a dream, congratulations, you're already 10 steps ahead of 95% of the world. Imagine if Michael Jordan was scared of missing, he would have never taken a shot. Imagine if Steve Jobs was afraid of people not liking his product, there would be no iPhone. So ask yourself this, do you want to be a person who fears failure? Or do you want to be a person who loves success? Which one? You have to pick today and I'll tell you one thing. 
One is a failure and one is a success. And if you love success, there is nothing that can stop you. All those negative things people say will mean nothing. They're gonna talk about how only 1% make it to the top big deal. Wanna know something else? Only 1% stick with that fitness program long enough to see results. Let's talk about what nobody wants to talk about. Who here has ever failed? Who's here has failed miserably at something you wanted to achieve? When you failed, why did you fail? Didn't have enough time, didn't have the right technology, didn't have the money, didn't have the contacts, you know, had the wrong people. The people said we had the wrong leader. Everything you people have told me, I didn't have the technology, I didn't have the right contacts, I didn't have the time, I didn't have money. Everything you've told me, I didn't have enough Supreme Court justices, those are resources. And so you're telling me I failed because I didn't have the resources. And I'm here to tell you what you already know. Resources are never the problem. It's a lack of resourcefulness is why you failed. Because the ultimate resources are emotional states. If you're creative enough, can you find the answer? Yes or no? If you're determined enough, can you find the breakthrough? Yes or no? If you're passionate, loving enough, can you get someone to help you? Yes or no? If there's no way that you're committed, can you find the money, even if you don't have it? Yes or no? So I said creativity, decisiveness, passion, honesty, sincerity, love. These are the ultimate human resources. And when you engage these resources, you can get any other resource on earth. And I said, so you told me all the resources you're missing and you hypnotize yourself into believing that you don't have what you want because you don't have the resources. When the most successful people in history had no resources, but they were incredibly resourceful, so they got the resources. Resourcefulness is the ultimate resource. And if you don't have what you want, Stop telling yourself the story because you don't have the money, you don't have the time. That's bullshit. It's because you haven't committed yourself where you would burn your boats. If you want to take the fucking island, burn your fucking boats and you will take the island because people, when they're going to either die or succeed, tend to succeed. But most of us give ourselves a way out and that's why we don't have what we want. So if you and I really want to know what's going to take to get your dream and make it real, it's to stop all the things you told yourself that aren't. And I'm here to tell you what I said at the top of our discussion. 80% of success is psychology and 20% is mechanics. That's true of running your business. That's true of your intimate relationship. That's true of your body. That's true in your level of happiness. So you've got to know the 20% because that gives you the edge, right? Those strategies. But you've got to know the psychology. If you're in business right now, there's a few things. The chokehold on the growth of your business is you. It is not your people. It is the leader of this organization. The leader is the chokehold. And the chokehold comes in one of two forms. Your psychology. You think you've tried everything. You've tried everything but what can works. Or it's a skill that you're missing. Like you really are incredible at writing code, but you don't know sh about accounting and finance and it's eating your business alive. Because I got to tell you, 96% of all businesses in a 10 year period of time go under. Only 4% make it. By the way, make it doesn't mean that you succeed and have any money. It just means you're still standing. 4%. And by the way, after 10 years, you're set, right? There's no more challenges. If you got in a business and you're in it right now, I love you, I respect you as a brother or sister, and I know you're a crazy son of a bitch just like me. You have to be. Who gets in a sport where the longer you play, the more likely you die? You're a gladiator if you're in business. A gladiator goes out there and they know every time I go out, I can die, and the longer I stay in the game, the more likely I die, but every day they go out to win. That takes an incredible psychology. But in that psychology, we bump onto limits, and that's what you gotta shift. And if your psychology is solved, you gotta say, where are the skills I'm missing? Because that's equally important. If you don't know how to market in the world we're in today, if you don't know the cutting edge of marketing, I'm only here today. I have the privilege to be with you here. I created a brand, and that's why I have the privilege to serve you.
But that brand came because I realized early in my career, I could have the best ideas in the world, but they're going to die on my lips unless I can market them, unless I can build a brand. It is the most important thing today because the world is made up of commodities. The world is so competitive. If you're a commodity, if you're a race to the lowest price, you will be out of business within 10 years, probably more like two to five. You have to have something that separates you from everybody else on earth. And until you find out that something, you will be stressed and you will be struggling. But everybody has it or anybody can create it. That's my expertise. My companies, I started with zero. We do more than five billion with a B per year, my companies. My, how the f did you do that when it's not even your focus? We all have a set of belief systems, different kinds of beliefs about if something happens, then it means something else. So for example, do we have rules for like what people do if they love us, yes or no? So if a person loves you, then they what? They respect you. And by the way, does this person also then have a set of rules for if you respect them, then you, and they have to look at them a certain way, don't raise your voice. If you respect me, then you don't raise your voice. If you respect me, then you tell me the truth. If you respect me, you follow what I'm saying here? And you know what the problem is? All these rules are unconscious. What else? If a person loves you, they what? Trust you. Good. If a person loves you, then they communicate. If a person loves you, then they compromise. Now, some people's rules are never in life do you compromise. To compromise is to give up your integrity. Some people's idea of integrity is if you compromise, then you have no integrity. A lot of us have rules that are absolutely totally unfair to us. For example, yeah, my favorite program that I do is all on this destiny technology I developed, where I ask the question constantly, what makes people do what they do? And I started asking that question more intensely after a guy embezzled a quarter of a million dollars from me, and had me $758,000 in debt. So I came up with all these incredible distinctions and I refined them in the last three or four years by doing a research project. My research project is called Date with Destiny. What it is, the most powerful program I do, I take like 100 people at a time, I've been doing this now for about two and a half years, and before they even get there, I get about 18 pages from them on every emotion they ever feel, what triggers it for them, what they believe is most important in life, what they think their experiences of life were, and I analyze every single thing about this person I can. And we bring them in here and we find out what their core beliefs and values and rules are. Because that determines how you interpret your life, how you feel like. Then we change that and change their whole life. So for example, if your highest value in life was security, you're going to make decisions differently than if your number one value is adventure, right? Well, if you had somebody's highest value security, the last one was adventure, one day you swap them. You might change their personality a little bit. Changes everything. Everything. And we don't do it haphazardly. We find out what they want in their life, and we make sure their values are consistent with what they want. Because most people are being pulled in two different directions, right? They, they want to, like, be successful, and they don't want to ever be rejected. <laughs> Guess again. And most people are trying to meet two masters that can't be met, so they get pulled apart and they sabotage a lot of stuff. But the biggest challenge for people, I think, is their rules. Most people in life have wired their brain where it's really, really hard to feel good. Every upset you've ever had or you ever will have with another human being is a rules upset. You are not upset with a human being. You're upset with their rules because you have a different set of rules. So every upset you've ever had with another human being has been a rules upset. And whether we get pain or whether we get pleasure in any moment is not based on what happens, but our giving ourselves that pain and pleasure based upon our rules. People don't have enough rules in their life for themselves. So for instance, I get out of bed in 10 minutes or less, doesn't matter. And I don't want to. That's why I have the rule. Because I you went through callous your mind. Literally. I went through a period where I would lay in bed for three to four hours, a wash and shame, and my inability to get out of bed. And it just embarrassed me. And so I felt badly about myself. So I wanted to make a change. So I knew that I needed a bright line. So bright line, ten minutes or less, you get out of bed. As soon as you realize you're awake, that's it. So and the rule is more specific. It's like I have to have had at least five hours of sleep. Um but once you put the rule in place, then you just live by it. And that's how you earn credibility. Like right now, I don't feel the way telling you that, that I want to feel. This is a good moment. He's on my team. I'm pointing uh -huh. at him. This is a good moment. So I'm saying this and I don't feel good about saying it. Why? Because today 
I don't know what happened. I got out of bed in 11 minutes. And I was so you literally pissed. time it. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, from yeah, yeah. waking up to actually physically getting out of the bed. Correct. Uh -huh. My feet okay. must be on the floor and I this must be challenge. standing up before it ticks over into the 11th minute. And today, I don't know what happened. I, I was I was aware of the time. I knew I needed to get up. And for whatever reason, one of the minutes just went faster than I thought. When I looked back, I was like, damn it. And so I'm surprised you even made minutes. it here today then. Right? Yeah. So now this comes into like knowing how to handle something like that. Like if you totally fall apart because you don't live up to one of your rules, you're violating another one of my rules, which is don't do anything that doesn't move you towards your goals. So it's like, yes, I, I, it is a part of my identity to confess this. So because I'm talking about it, I want to say it now to an audience. It's the only thing that will allow me to reset and be able to feel good about it again because I don't lie when I miss it. I own it. Well, look, if your biggest problem is it took you 11 minutes to get out Sadly, of Sadly, that's not my biggest problem. This, is a, this that, is a high quality problem. Right. Yes, very yeah, true. Like, I, but my thing is people don't have the rules. Uh -huh. And so I have other rules. For instance, I wear a size 32 pant. It's just, that's it. And so no matter what your waist is, no, no, no. I won't let my waist uh -huh. get out of line with that. So I use the pants as a way to guide. Now I would go down if I got so lean that I was, you know, a 31, that's not a problem, but I'm not going to allow myself to go up. And it's super tempting, like, especially around Christmas. I don't try to hold abs through the winter. So yeah, during Christmas, like right now, I do not have abs. So, and I'm totally fine with that. I switch a different part of my mentality. I, during the holidays, my wife and I definitely celebrate with food and it's amazing. And I love it the most. So, but if that celebration took me up to like 32s don't fit anymore, I got to come back because I have a rule. So it's like, that's how I keep myself in a lane. I keep myself from getting into trouble. I know the things that I accept for myself and what I don't accept for myself. And it's all like stated. It's very clear. Stop doing the things that you know are wrong that you could stop doing. Right. So it's, it's a fairly, it's a fairly limited attempt. First of all, we're not going to say that you know what the good is or what the truth is in any ultimate sense. But we will presume that there are things that you're doing that for one reason or another, you know, are not in your best interests. There's something about them that you just know you should stop. They're kind of self-evident to you. Other things you're going to be doubtful about. You're not going to know which way is up and which way is down. But there are things that you're doing that you know you shouldn't do. Now, some of those you won't stop doing for whatever reason. You don't have the discipline or maybe there's a secondary payoff or you don't believe it's necessary or it's too much of a sacrifice or you're angry or resentful or, or afraid. Who knows? So forget about those for now. But there's another subset that you could stop doing. It might be a little thing. Well, that's fine. Stop doing it and see what happens. And what will happen is your vision will clear a little bit. And then something else will pop up in your field of apprehension that you will also know you should stop doing and that you could stop doing because you've strengthened yourself a bit by stopping doing the particular stupid thing that you were doing before. That just puts you together a little bit more. And you could do that repeatedly for, for an indefinite period of time. And, and you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to ever be able to formulate a clear and final picture of what constitutes the truth and the good. But it does mean that you'll be able to continually move away from what's untruth and what's bad. And, you know, that's not a bad start. This is a very crucial uh, concept for, for me and for virtually all of us. It's this idea of taking your life in your own hands and being the kind of person that you choose to be and understanding that everything that comes your way is an opportunity, is a blessing. And it wasn't until I learned how to celebrate virtually everything that came my way that I was able to transcend it. You see, everything that was given to us by God, whatever that is, is perfect. No one can deny the mountains are perfect and the rivers are perfect and the birds are perfect and the hippopotamuses are perfect and, and, and so on. This is just 
what was given to us. Everything else that you have on our planet, that we have on our planet, comes about as a result of thinking. Thinking. Thought makes it so. All right? This microphone comes about as a result of thinking. Somebody imagines it. Somebody then tells somebody else, and it's and it creates it. The dress that you're wearing, the shirt that I'm wearing, the shoes that you have, the stage, these cameras. Everything that you see that wasn't given to us was created by man as a result of the way that we think. The way that we think. So what gets inside of us as a cell comes about as a result of the way that we choose to think in our lives. Very important principle to understand. Because once you get a hold of thinking, and that it creates everything that you have in your life, you can change and make it as absolutely perfect as you want it to be, because thought makes it so. I started feeling like, I think everybody knows I've, I've moved my whole life on instinct, you know? I feel like now it's time to let the show go. I feel like it's time to move on because I've grown as much as I can grow. When I've grown as much as I can grow in a space, that's my instinct to move. We have more power to influence our thoughts and our beliefs. And so there are a lot of tools and techniques out there that are resources. Like when I grew up, I, you know, we, we didn't have any we, we had no money, right? I had no education because I was a very learning challenge. I didn't know any, anybody, right? So I feel like it's not, when people are, that's where they'll go though. When they, when they, when there's a gap, stop gap between where they are and where they want to be, they'll say, oh, I don't have the money or I don't have the education or I don't have the intelligence or I don't have the network or anything else like that. And you know, what, what you know, as for all incredible success you've had and the value you've created for the world is that it's not about resources. Right, because we know a lot of people who, who didn't have any resources that were able to impact the world. Um, it's about our internal resources, and what I'm saying is optimizing our environment, optimizing our behaviors, our capabilities, our beliefs, and our values, and our identity. Right, that at the highest level, our identity, because you can't just change your belief or your values or your behavior even if you don't believe you're that kind of person. You know, that's why I kind of always go to the superhero mythos because I, I want people to, to claim that identity. I call it the superhero you, that version of ourselves that we're not waiting for Superman or Batman or Wonder Woman. It's like you are Wonder Woman, you are Batman, you are Superman. It's just we, we have to commit ourselves to be able to unleash you. what you're after, what you're looking to become. If you don't go to the gym, it's going to hurt you. If you go to the gym, it's going to hurt you. I'm okay with failing sometimes. I'm humble enough to understand that I can't be good at everything. I understand that I got to continue to work on my craft. I understand that I'm not the best at what I do right now. I understand that. Do what you can, but not what you must. In every circumstance we face, we are constantly presented with these two choices. Where they are on talking to that person that doesn't have a problem laying in obscurity because you know that when you come out of the dark room, all eyes on you. We live in a culture of business, distraction and noise. And sometimes the only way something's going to change is if we disappear. Sometimes you've got to delete the app. Sometimes you have to walk away. I want to improve. That doesn't mean I don't struggle with my motivation from time to time. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah. mean I don't get confused or down. Of course I do, yeah. but I'm not for sale. Yeah. You can't buy me. And you know this too. We see friends of ours, even guys in their 60s, and they sold their company for blah, blah, blah. Now they golf nine days a week or whatever. You know, That's fine, but yeah, they're for yeah. sale. They were bought. You were bought. You were for sale. Uh -huh. I'm not for sale. Rule number three, serve people. Everything in your life happens for you, not to you. I'm just a huge believer in that. And so uh, my baseball dream ended. I had an injury, probably gave me a premature end to occur that would have ended anyways in hindsight because I played with enough great players 
that I kind of know there was a gap in just God-given ability level, not work ethic, but I think to be the greatest, there has to be some proclivity for it and work ethic, right? And so I kind of maxed out my limited abilities. Um, and so when I got released, I ended up moving back home with my parents. I couldn't find a job. I was depressed. I spent about a year at my parents' house. Your muscles are going to tear. But on the other side of that pain, there is a reward. There isn't any regret. You won't regret taking care of your body. On the other side of making those healthy decisions, there is a reward. It's the reward of discipline. It's the reward of longevity. It's the reward of influence. It's the reward of power. Do you want results? Do you want a reward? Or do you want regrets? The decision is yours. It's all hard, so choose your heart. Pain is inevitable and it is unavoidable. Pick your pain. Sometimes you have to fall back into the dark room and focus on it. Everybody wants destiny, everybody wants. Manifestation, everybody wants. Fulfillment, everybody wants the next. Level and the relationship and the higher quality of living. But nobody wants to. Eliminate distractions, nobody wants to. Disappear for three months, four months, six months, and get into a place where you can focus on. Just broke in every way, financially, spiritually, mentally, physically. I remember my dad came home, my dad had just got sober, and my dad said to me, hey, I met this guy at a meeting, I got you a job. You get your ass down there tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Getting out of this house and getting a job. And I'm like, okay, I have a college degree. You know, I'm being picky for a year watching Maury Povich reruns every day on TV and Jerry Springer. I go down there at 6 a.m. I walk in, I said, hey, my name's Eddie Milet. I'm here for the job. They're like, what job? I remember this vividly, right? And I'm like, I don't know. Um, they just told me you'd know. And they go, well, we have no idea who you are and we don't know what the job is. They said, do you know who's hiring you? I said, I don't remember. And they go, well, then you need to come back. And I go to the door and I go, wait a minute. His name's Tim. They're like, there's a lot of Tims. And I go, well, I know he must be an alcoholic because he was at a meeting with my dad last night. They go, oh, drunk Tim. We know Tim, right? And where I was was a place called McKinley Home for Boys. It was a group home, a campus of group homes. Everybody's got a plan until life knocks them out because we weren't ready for the pain. And when the pain came, we did not process it. Processing pain is a skill set you've got to acquire. It's a type of currency. If you want the future, if you want next level, if you want tomorrow, if you want to manifest, if you want this thing, I don't care what it is, then you're going to have to get acquainted with pain, the pain of discipline, the pain of growth, the pain of learning, the pain of giving, the pain of forgiving. It all hurts. So pick your pain. Choose your heart. Because at some juncture in life, at some corner you're going to turn, you are going to encounter pain, and you've got to process that pain well. Hear me when I say it. Pain is unavoidable. It's hard to let go of the past. If you could just shut out every distraction, what if you could just shut up the world for just a season and focus on it? A man is rewarded in public for what he as in private, can you unplug for just a moment and focus on you, focus on what matters? Why are you here? What is your destiny? The reason why you don't see it, the reason why it is not manifested, the reason why you are so frustrated. But I realize it's only going to make me more driven. It's going to teach me to do better. It's going to make me want to work a little bit harder to get exactly what I need. Maybe this is the time to say that maybe, just maybe, this is the time for me to humble myself. A lot of people are not ready to be humble. It's okay to have confidence. It's okay to believe in yourself. You're supposed to believe in yourself. But many people are not ready to be taught. Do it now or do it later. Discipline and procrastination. A choice between a disciplined existence bearing the fruit of achievement and contentment or procrastination. The easy life for which the future will bear no fruit, only the bare branches of mediocrity. The rewards of a disciplined life are great, but they're often delayed until some time in the future. The rewards for the lack of discipline are immediate, but they are minor in comparison to the immeasurable rewards of consistent self-discipline. 
An immediate reward for lack of discipline is a fun day at the beach. A future reward of discipline is owning the beach. For most, we choose today's pleasure rather than tomorrow's fortune. But failure is how we learn. Failure is how we grow. Failure doesn't make you weak. Failure teaches you. It gives you an understanding that you've got to continue to work and you've got to continue to thrive on it and walk in it and run in it and roll in it. Whatever it is you got to do as long as you're proceeding to go forward, moving in it, getting where you need to be in your life, not feel accomplished. We're not here to feel anything. We're here to go through it. We're here to learn from it. And sometimes you got to fail. That's how you will succeed. Wanting is always something that is going through our minds. You hear it all the time. I want, I want, I want. So how can you get rid of the easy distractions? How can you keep your mind on what you're trying to do? How can you keep an attitude of doing it all and doing it now? How can you make the choice of discipline over procrastination? How can you stay focused on your ambitions? How can you avoid conversations at the water cooler? You can keep your focus on your work. You can get it done today instead of tomorrow. You've got to really work on your consistent self-discipline on a daily basis or you'll find yourself distracted. Distracted by negative thoughts, distracted by negative people, distracted by water cooler chatter, and pretty soon, depending on the type of people you've associated with, distracted by your doubts within yourself. Never underestimate the power of influence and associations, and never underestimate the power of your own consistent self-discipline. You have not been willing to forsake all that you've been called to forsake and to follow through behind closed doors so you can talk about it sure you can not plan it sure you can write it down sure you could go to the conference and hear about it you could read about it but at some juncture you have to disappear and put the work in and come back in shock everybody that doubted you I'm talking to that man that woman that boy the girl who feels the fire in their belly If people are not listening to you, stop talking to them. That is the best piece of advice that I can give you. And what happens is, is that if you stop talking to people who aren't listening to you and start watching them instead, they will tell you what they're up to. But so if you have things to say, say them. But you find people that will listen, talk to them. The ones who aren't listening, pull back. Because you're, you're devaluing what you have to say by offering it to an audience that does nothing but reject it. And you spend a lot of time going around trying to convince other people or trying to get their approval. What will happen is that you will lose your nerve. And other people will convince you that what you're doing doesn't have any value. There are certain things that we just go through life just taking. And at some point, you just got to draw the line and just say enough is enough. You got to do that with yourself. You just got to draw. There's certain things that you just don't permit. If you got negative people in your life, just one. So look here. I was talking to someone I love very much, had a just dynamic relationship with us. So look here. I can't grow from that. If you're persistent and saying those kind of things to me, I'm saying to you right now, I won't tolerate that. And I will terminate this because I'm not going to expose myself to this type of humiliation. I don't like that. I don't like getting called on names, and putting each other down. I don't like that. Come back to me, I'm sorry. No, that won't get it. So you put a nail in a hole, you make that impression, you pull a nail out, that mark is still there. That's not for God. We can't subtract that from the record. So don't, don't say that to me. So we were talking about something else. Person said it again. Boom. You're a loser. Very good. And you are too, because you just lost a very good friend. I don't choose to be around you anymore. And that was it. I said, that's cool. Maybe it is. But I get people out of my life that aren't good for me. 
One negative stroke is 16 times more powerful than a positive stroke. And if you have people around you who are not sensitive to who you are, and the people that can hurt you the most, ladies and gentlemen, are the people that you love, that you love. They're the ones that you're vulnerable to. They're the ones that can get to you. And if they're insensitive, I don't care who they are. See, if you don't draw the line with people, if you just let them run rampant in your life, and you let things happen to you that you don't feel good about, if you continue to allow it to happen, you won't feel good about yourself. Your image of yourself will erode. So you've got to draw the line. Federal White said something. To go against the dominant thinking of your family, friends, and those people you associate with every day is perhaps the most difficult act of courage you will ever perform. See, when you start growing, when you start changing, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you act, the way you respond to things, the way you use your time, when you start saying no, I can't do that. Why? You, you're too busy. You don't have the time. No, I have my own agenda. You also have to be strong enough to say no. Remember, you teach people how to treat you and they will walk all over you if you let them. So when you love yourself enough to say no, when they ask you to do certain things that are not in your character, you quickly will say no. I'm not doing that because I know if I allow myself to go there, I'm going to be the one that's hurt. I'm going to be the one that's broken. I'm going to be the one that's battered and bruised. So absolutely not. And I've said this many times before. Some of you guys are weak and you're quick to say yes. Love yourself enough to say no. you got to have a good, strong, solid no muscle that you can stand in and you got to have a yes muscle. You got to say no to the things that don't honor you. No to the things that don't bring you joy. No to the things that don't bring you peace. And you don't have to explain your no. You got to have a hundred and one different ways to say no. You matter. And your no matters. And don't back up on your no. Don't draw your line in the sand, and when somebody crosses it, you back up and draw another line. No, stand on your line. Stand for your no. So if, if people can put you on a guilt trip, they will. And use you and abuse you over and over and over again. You gotta draw the line. You have to draw the line on them. I think it's really important in any relationship that you ask yourself this question. What is my cost for being in this relationship? Because there's a cost in every relationship you're in, there's a cost. And you have to ask yourself, what is the cost of being in there? Uh, if, if the cost is you have to lose yourself, you can't be who you are, do what you do, you, you can't be the person you are because you must conform to them in order to coexist peacefully, the cost is you. If the cost is you have to work at it, that's okay. The cost is you have to make some sacrifices, that's okay. But ask yourself in every relationship you're in, what's the cost for being in this relationship? And you'll see real quick whether it's worth the price or whether it's not. Basically what you're saying is if you got haters around you, in your family or not, you got to get them out of your way. Have you ever taken an idea to a person, or no matter what you take to them, it, 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 they, it's not a good idea? Right. It's just something wrong. You know, you know when I share an idea with you, and you don't show me how to make that idea work. All your conversation is why it won't work. Yeah. I immediately end that conversation. I'm not interested in why it won't work. That's going to arise on the journey. I just need to know, can you feel what I'm saying? Are you on board with it? Do you have a suggestion how to make it work? The moment I hear, well, you know, I don't think that'll work. Okay, cool, thank you. And I'm gone. You know, one of the things that my Angelo used to always say to me, and I love this, I actually said it uh, at her memorial service. She used to say to me, because in the beginning, it used to bother me so much when people would talk about the haters. And she used to say to me, baby, those people can't hold a candle to the light that God already <laughs> has shining on your face. Yeah. Can't you see the light that God has shining on your face? That's and so I learned to focus on the light that God has shining on 
my face and not worry about the people who are trying to put up a candle and burn it. Don't go through life feeling like you're powerless. Victims are people that are powerless. You're not powerless. You are powerful. You direct the power in your life. Whatever your life is right now, it is a duplication of your consciousness. It's a result of how you have decided to use your power. That's all it is. That's not who you are. That's just a perverted use of your power that you aren't satisfied with. And you've got the power to change that. Wherever you are, how? I don't know. But I know you've got the power to do that. But you don't know what has happened to me. It really doesn't matter what has happened to you. See, the only thing that really matters is what are you going to do about it? That's all that matters. That's all that matters. You can allow it to destroy you or you can allow it to build you up.